And good afternoon. I know we have a lot of people who are still filtering in, but I also know that uh, Professor Berman has a lot of content that he would like to cover, so I'm going to get us started. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome to those that are in the room and are coming into the room as those that are joining virtually uh, to the Georgia State School of Public Health Grand Round Series. This is a monthly series that we've been hosting now for just about two years. Um, and it's been a fantastic opportunity for us to bring and meet with scholars from all over the country. And I'm particularly excited to have a friend and colleague here today and very much looking forward to his talk. But I will leave his formal introduction up to Professor Leslie Wolf, who is the Ben F. Johnson Jr. Chair and Distinguished University Professor from the College of Law here at Georgia State. Thank you, Jelaine. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, but, but first, I want to uh, thank Jelaine and the School of Public Health for giving us the opportunity from the Law School Center for Law, Health, and Society to collaborate in bringing Micah here. Uh, Micah Berman is the Stephen F. Loeb Professor in Health Services Management and Policy at The Ohio State University's College of Public Health. He is also professor of law at The Ohio State University's Michael E. Moritz College of Law. His research is at the intersection of public health research and legal doctrine. He is the co-author of The New Public Health Law, a transdisciplinary approach to practice and advocacy. I could go on for much longer, um, but what I do want to note before I uh, turn it over to Professor Berman is his work is really, he's very much known for his tobacco policy work and his outstanding contributions to public health and tobacco control have, um, through both research and advocacy, has been uh, honored with the David P. Rall Award for Advocacy in Public Health from the American Public Health Association in 2021. He also received the John Slade Award from the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. As I say, we could go on for much longer, but we would rather hear from him. So please come to welcome Professor Michael Bourbon. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Jalan. I mean, it's not a good way to start. Might move these out of the way. Uh, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I, I'm sure you all know how lucky you are to have wonderful scholars and wonderful people uh, like Leslie and Jelaine on your faculty here at Georgia State. And it's so wonderful to be at a place where there is collaboration between the School of Public Health and the law school. Um, I was just thinking I was here about 10 years ago that some of you might remember, I talked about manipulation in the law. So it's been 10 years and I've changed a couple letters and we're gonna talk about misinformation in the law today. Um, so what I'm presenting here is a book chapter that I've been working on and uh, the book is going to be called Backlash, The War on Public Health with these editors. Two of them are here. So on the left, that is Amy Fairchild, who was my dean at the College of Public Health at Ohio State and is now at Syracuse University. And then on the right, that is Marion Moser-Jones, who is still my colleague at Ohio State, both at the College of Public Health and the Department of History. Both of them are historians, historians of public health by training. Um, they have been doing interviews with state and local public health officials all across the country and former uh, public health officials all across the country to talk about their experiences during COVID. And they settled on this theme of backlash um, to, to frame the book. And they asked me to write about the legal aspects of this backlash. And so I decided to write about this intersection of misinformation in the law, which is something that I've been thinking about and actually had been discussing with Amy Fairchild through the course of the pandemic. And you know, it seemed to me that this is a topic that has not gotten 
as much attention uh, as some other aspects of, of legal developments uh, over the course of the last few years, uh, but it does tie pretty directly to this backlash theme. So this is what I'm working on. I will give the caveat that it is very much a work in progress, so I'm still working through some of these ideas and hopefully we'll have some time for a discussion of them. So, on February 15th, 2020, the WHO Director General said we are not fighting uh, an epidemic, or not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic, and fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. That was February 15th, 2020. There were about 15 confirmed COVID cases in the US at the time, although far more in other countries. And I think he could not possibly have known how correct he was. Uh, so ever since that time, we have been just flooded with misinformation of all sorts. But not all misinformation is created equal. Uh, there are random people saying things on the internet all the time. There are anti-vaccine groups that are saying things. There are AI bots that are producing misinformation. There are foreign governments. There are foreign governments using AI bots. Uh, there's you know, lots of different sources of misinformation. Um, but for public health purposes, it matters who the source of the information is. So it makes a huge difference if the misinformation is coming from a random person on the internet versus the Surgeon General of a state versus the President of the United States, if you all remember this one. So, Claudia Haupt and Wendy Parmet wrote an article in the Illinois Law Review, actually pretty early in the pandemic, pointing out that a lot of attention had been paid to misinformation being shared by doctors, and there were early efforts to talk about professional discipline of doctors sharing misinformation, but that less attention had been paid to public health officials and elected officials who were sharing misinformation, whether at the local or state or federal level. And as they pointed out, that was an equally, if not more, troubling trend because you know, at least some people look to public health officials and elected officials uh, for cues as to what to believe, what to do, uh, and they can have quite a lot of influence and reach, and it's, it's their job to protect us. So when they're telling us to do certain things to protect our health, like those are the people that, um, in theory, we are supposed to look to and take our cues from. So th that was the article that they wrote, and what I want to do is sort of add to that and suggest that there's sort of another layer of misinformation that is also problematic and maybe even more problematic, and that is when public officials not only share misinformation in you know, public statements or their tweets, uh, but they actually take that misinformation and use it to shape law. Uh, so that's the dynamic that started to see was going on during COVID. Sometimes it is misinformation shaping law in some respects, and sometimes it was actually misinformation being written directly into the text of the law. I'm not sure how important that distinction really is because most people don't actually read the text of laws, uh, but it, it was an interesting indicator that it was actually misinformation driving law when it is written uh, directly into uh, the text. So that's the dynamic that I'm going to talk about, and, and I think the reason that's so important, and, and my co-author Scott Burris has written and talked about this a lot, law has really important communicative effects. So we often think about law in terms of you know, the provisions and what they actually say about who has to do what, uh, and you know, what the penalties are and how they're enforced, but law itself communicates values um, communicates information, gives people cues about what sort of behavior is acceptable or not, uh, ways that people should act, attitudes that are okay or not, and that communicative effect is uh, a really important function of law, and uh, when misinformation is driving what's in the law, um, it can be quite problematic in, in that respect. So, 
that's what I'm going to dive into. And I became really curious about sort of how unique this was during COVID or whether this had historical antecedents. And once I started thinking about it, it was like pretty easy to think about lots of historical examples of misinformation shaping law. So what I want to talk about is first some historical examples. This is not a systematic example. This is just some um, examples that uh, I think illustrate different types of way that misinformation has found its way into law in the past. Um, want to talk about why this might be happening or why it happened in the past, some explanations or motivations for misinformation shaping law, and then talk about what happened during COVID and whether this actually is different, and I think that it may be. So we'll, we'll talk through that, but uh, um, I, th I think there are some uh, aspects of this going on now that may be uh, unprecedented and really particularly problematic. So three quick disclaimers. Uh, one is that what I'm focusing on for these purposes is state laws and primarily statutes. So it's, it's just a very limited lens of what law is. So not looking at court decisions, not looking at you know, administrative agencies, not looking at how these things actually played out in real life, just looking to, to, as an initial cut of this, to keep this manageable at actually the text of laws. Um, second thing is that for purposes of this presentation, I'm not gonna try to define what misinformation is um, in, a, in a careful way. Uh, what uh, I'm pretty much talking about is factual assertions that are demonstrably false, um, but I'm not gonna sort of get into how you would establish that something is demonstrably false or you know, the nature of truth uh, would, would take us a little too long to, uh, to talk about. Um, and uh, also, you know, there, there's probably distinctions in some of these examples between how much the people involved knew or should have known um, that what they were saying was false, and so that, that may or may not matter. Um, third thing is when I get to the COVID side of things, I'm gonna be talking pretty much exclusively about Republican-dominated states. And my point here is not to be political or partisan. It's just that when you think about what happened during COVID, things became highly politically polarized. And I think there was misinformation exaggerating the harms of COVID and there was misinformation minimizing the harms of COVID. But the minimizing side is what primarily found its way into law. Uh, and what I think is, is most problematic from the public health perspective. So that's why that's, those are the issues that I'm uh, focusing on here. So I'm gonna dive into history and dive straight into the area of expertise of Paul Lombardo, which makes me nervous. Um, so we'll start with example number one being the eugenics movement. And you know, this is just one of the most egregious examples of the field of public health endorsing a theory that was built on a foundation of misinformation. And as Paul Lombardo has written, that often found its way into law. And the most consequential, consequential and chilling example of this is that between 1907 and 1937, 32 states adopted eugenic sterilization laws that authorized the involuntary sterilization of those with intellectual disabilities or mental health issues, sometimes physical disabilities, uh, usually for people that were housed in state-run facilities. And these laws were endorsed by the Supreme Court in the 1927 Buck versus Bell decision. Uh, and these laws, over time, led to the forced sterilization of more than 65,000 women almost universally low-income women, and in some states, predominantly women of color. And not only was eugenics uh, the premise of these laws, but some of these laws directly put that premise into the law. So this was the 1924 Act in Virginia, which was actually the act that was at issue in the Buck versus Bell case, where the law itself said, heredity plays an important part in the transmission of sanity 
idiocy, imbecility, epilepsy, and crime, which was the faulty premise of all of these laws. And, and, and this was actually based on a model law. So it, it, you know, other states had laws that were pretty similar to this. Uh, and you know, this may be a case where the people involved truly believed um, in this theory that they were promoting, as Paul has pointed out, there might have been other motivations as well um, behind some of these laws. Uh, but uh, in retrospect, this was clearly a false premise uh, and misinformation being uh, built into the law itself. I'm gonna fast forward in time all the way to the 1970s and Laetrile might be a less familiar example. Uh, Laetrile was a chemical that was derived from apricot pits and it was touted as a treatment for cancer and to oversimplify the story here, the producers of Laetrile, the company that made it, put out the theory that cancer was actually caused by a vitamin deficiency and that that vitamin deficiency could be treated with Laetril, which was a previously unrecognized vitamin, which they also referred to as B17. Uh, and this was not true. Uh, this was um, in the context of Watergate, the Vietnam War, uh, lots of kind of rising interest in alternative medicine, distrust in government, um, and the FDA consistently said that there is no evidence behind this. Um, it, we will not approve it. Um, this, well, they didn't even get a request to approve it. They, they, it was an unapproved drug, and they said you know, this cannot legally be sold, but the, the FDA's statements then led to conspiracy theories that this was actually you know, a miracle cure that was being suppressed. And even though Laetrile never showed any promise at all of, of being effective and when consumed in higher doses was actually quite toxic, 27 states passed laws legalizing the use of Laetrile. These laws had limited practical effect because it was not authorized by the FDA, uh, but they may have had a significant communicative effect. It was the government and the legislatures indicating that there was some promise here. And so the New Jersey law, for example, said that Laetrile could be, could be prescribed for, quote, the treatment of any malignancy, disease, illness, or physical condition, uh, or for use as a prophylactic medication. And so this is maybe you know, less clear of the, the misinformation itself being written into law, but the clear premise of that was that Laetrile is something that might be a treatment uh, uh, or uh, preventative for uh, cancer. So just as a quick side note, when I you know, did a quick internet search on Laetrile, I think this came up on the first page. Um, so it has you know, had a resurgence during COVID. Um, so here you have you know, two conspiracy theories neatly in two lines of uh, the internet. Um, so, and if you're interested in this story, um, Lewis Grossman's new-ish book uh, called Choose Your Medicine about uh, the, the history of, uh, of these kind of right to try uh, efforts um, has a good chapter on the story. Example three, I'm gonna jump to Leslie Wolf's area of expertise. Um, in you know, the 1980s, um, when HIV AIDS was first identified, it was lethal and terrifying. And because its emergence was first detected in gay men and it was spread primarily through sexual conduct, uh, it was very quickly socially constructed as a, a gay disease, which then provoked further stigma and discrimination. And all of that led to very widespread beliefs in misinformation uh, about AIDS. So historian Alan Brandt uh, reports that in 1985, 34% of people believe that it was unsafe to associate with someone with AIDS even when no physical contact was involved. So, and you know, there's 
Brian White was excluded from school and, and, and lots of, you know, there was talk about quarantine and, and all of these um, uh, different aspects of that. So this fear found its way into law in lots of different ways. And so just to pick out one, a number of states passed laws criminalizing or enhancing criminal penalties for spitting on someone who, uh, spitting on someone while the person doing it is HIV positive. Um, this despite the fact that spitting has never ever been shown um, to transmit HIV. Um, but there were lots of criminalization laws in this space that, that were just quite disconnected from the way that the virus actually works. Um, and that I think public health law scholars would say just serve to reinforce and deepen uh, discrimination and stigma and, and many of those laws are actually still in effect. Uh, example number four, this is my last example, kind of up to modern times, um, abortion. Um, this is a case, I think, not so much of misinformation driving the law. So, I mean, the notion that life begins at conception is not a factual question, uh, but it is a case where misinformation has been deployed by law uh, in order to uh, discourage abortion. So pre-Dobbs, uh, a number of states required abortion providers to give people seeking information about abortion information that was not accurate. Um, and so this is from Indiana. This was the disclosure uh, that was required. Actually, in, in Indiana, before getting an abortion, you'd have to acknowledge that you had been told uh, all of these things. Uh, one of which, if you can, probably can't see that too well, G says the objective scientific information shows that a fetus can feel pain at or before 20 weeks of post-fertilization age. Um, this part, G, um, was actually, the Indiana law was actually struck down in court um, with the court saying that it, quote, represented at best a fringe view within the medical community. Um, other states had you know, very similar um, disclosures or others about breast cancer and suicide and other things that um, are not backed up by, uh, by science. Um, also would just note part E at the top where it you know, requires that you were told that life begins when a human ovum is fertilized by a human sperm. Um, I mean, I think you could sort of consider that a form of misinformation when the state is insisting that it is fact um, as opposed to uh, opinion. Uh, all of this, of course, was pre-Dobbs, uh, and, and now abortion is virtually prohibited in Indiana, and we are seeing the effects of that in Ohio next door. Um, okay, so these are examples. So the question is, why um, is this mi misinformation being put into law? Um, these aren't the only examples. I would say another kind of big category is public health laws that are overstating the harms of things. Um, so drug laws are going back in history to prohibition um, where you know, information is where you know, there's a public health goal, but uh, people are pushing past what the facts um, actually support um, for various reasons. Um, so I could probably keep going on with other examples, but uh, why is this actually happening? So I'm probably missing some of these reasons, but here are some initial thoughts. So one is ideology slash religion slash politics. So you, know, you become so committed to your ideological or religious perspective that you just believe that that misinformation is true, or you are willing to stretch the truth to get to the outcome that you believe advances your political agenda. Discrimination. Um, and when discrimination intersects with fear, as in the case of HIV AIDS and really a lot of diseases over history, you get scapegoating. And there is a long, long history of that in, in public health of scapegoating different communities, and it's really why in going into COVID, 
there was a lot of fear among public health law scholars that the response would be driven by discrimination, um, by a sort of overly authoritarian response targeted at certain populations. Um, I don't think that's the story of what actually happened, but that was the, that was the fear um, going uh, into COVID because it had a very long basis in public health history. Uh, money, so there's often someone in the background that has a financial interest in pushing misinformation. I think that speaks for itself. Um, fear, um, already mentioned, but you know, fear of disease in particular can lead people to you know, overestimate and exaggerate uh, the harms. Distrust, uh, when there is you know, distrust of institutions, and particularly of government, um, either on its own or when combined with fear, uh, that lays the foundation for conspiracy theories. So I did not put conspiracy theories up as a separate topic because I think that, you know, that, that is the product here rather than the cause. Um, but you get those conspiracy theories when you have distrust and fear and discrimination, all, kind of all these things sometimes combining with each other um, produce different sorts of conspiracy theories. And then uh, hope. So, I mean, the, the Leotril example is you know, an example of people in desperate situations um, prone to believing misinformation because they want to have hope and that is totally, totally understandable. And you can't um, blame people for that, but there are a lot of people in that situation who get taken advantage of by people willing to offer that hope for money. Um, so all of these things obviously intersect with each other in, in different ways. So I tried to illustrate that. Um, so this is, of course, an oversimplification, but you know, these four examples, I think, highlight different things. So I mean, eugenics, there probably were people who were profiting, um, but really it was you know, ideology and politics and discrimination um, combining to be the driving um, forces there. Um, Leotril, there was, of course, a financial interest, but it was a combination of distrust and this need for hope. Um, for HIV and AIDS, it was you know, discrimination. It was discrimination linked to an anti-gay ideology, anti-gay politics, um, and it was also fear that, that drove that misinformation. Um, abortion is, I think, largely about ideology. Um, I just also kind of half highlighted um, discrimination here because I think it's also pretty clear that no similar requirements or disclosures would be put on men. Um, and uh, so I think there's, there's an important element of discrimination there um, as well. Okay, so that gets us to COVID. Um, you all lived through this, so I'm gonna try to go through this a little faster because um, you all experienced this. Um, so, there was an anti-vaccine movement that pre-existed COVID that really seized its moment um, during the pandemic. You might remember the video, the online video, Plandemic, that uh, took off early in the pandemic. That was released in May of 2020, so I just want to point out that that was before there were any vaccines. So the you know, fear of the vaccines, the conspiracy theories about the vaccines actually predated they're actually even being um, vaccines. But that was you know, putting out the theory that uh, essentially COVID itself was a plan uh, that was designed to allow some shadowy group of people to seize power and make money. So you see the you know, say no to Bill Gates hashtag um, uh, in this picture. And I would just say parenthetically as a Jewish person, that conspiracy has really, that conspiracy theory has very deep roots in anti-Semitism. Um, so we had all these myths that were coming out from the very beginning. The CDC had to, I don't know if you can see that, had to deal with, you know, myth COVID-19 vaccines contain microchips um, and myth receiving a COVID-19 vaccine can make you magnetic, which we had testimony about at the Ohio State House. And 
we had you know all of these conspiracy theories that then merged with the claims of some epidemiologists and some doctors that COVID was really not so bad, and all we had to do was protect the uh, quote unquote old and infirm, and then everything else, everyone else would have nothing to worry about, and we should just go back to um, life as usual. And that was a theory endorsed by Scott Atlas and Paul Alexander and others who held influential positions within the Trump administration. Uh, and the, the book, We Want Them Infected, by Jonathan Howard, the We Want Them Infected is a quote from Paul Alexander um, suggesting that the way to deal with COVID was to allow more people to get infected and that would get us to herd immunity faster and we could put this all uh, behind us. And so his book is like a 600 page book that, that really um, shows that in, in a lot of detail. Um, and that theory pretty quickly proved to be untrue, uh, but it had lasting influence and some of the scientists who endorsed that theory moved on to um, suggest that we should be pursuing a natural immunity approach as opposed to a vaccination approach uh, and really downplay the importance of vaccines and that eventually started finding its way into law. So we had more and more states that started passing laws that ban vaccine mandates um, or required a lot of exemptions from vaccine mandates, which is essentially another way of banning vaccine mandates. Um, and these, I think, were, were clearly influenced by that skepticism about the vaccine. So for example, Tennessee passed a law saying that a governmental entity shall not endorse or enforce a statute, ordinance, rule, policy, or practice arising from COVID-19 that fails to recognize natural immunity as providing a level of immune protection that is at least as protective as a COVID-19 vaccine. So that is requiring policies to acknowledge something that is at best highly misleading, um, if not outright false. So, I mean, the you know, immunity that you get from having COVID-19 um, does provide some protection from reinfection. It might actually provide for some amount of time um, protection that is equal to or greater than vaccines. Um, but what it does not do as well is protect you against hospitalization and death. Um, and so again, I think that is you know, highly misleading if not um, actually false. Uh, example two, um, lots of this in terms of therapies that were being promoted without an evidence base behind them. So just to focus in here, if you remember this tweet from the FDA that says, you are not a horse. Um, FDA later got sued about this tweet. Um, uh, but you know, ivermectin was one example of that. Uh, hydroxychloroquine was another. Um, for hydroxychloroquine, the FDA, under pressure from the Trump administration, actually granted an emergency use authorization for it and then withdrew it a couple of months later. Um, but this story is, you know, this one I think is you know, kind of like the Laetrile one, where um, people unsurprisingly wanted to believe that there were other options, and a lot of people latched on to conspiracy theories that uh, successful therapies were being repressed, and other people made a lot of money uh, off of those conspiracy theories. And you know, the reaction of Republican-led states was actually kind of mixed on this one, where some of them passed laws sort of reaffirming that um, these uh, products can't be prescribed in our state, and others went the opposite direction. Um, this was the law passed in Missouri. Other states had similar ones as well. Um, this is the provision about pharmacists. It says, and there was a parallel one about doctors. Um, this one said, the Board of Pharmacy shall not take any disciplinary action against any person due to the lawful dispensing, distributing, or selling of ivermectin tablets or hydro hydroxychloroquine sulfate tablets for human use in accordance with prescriber directions. A pharmacist shall not contact the, pre the prescribing physician or the patient to dispute the efficacy of ivermectin ta tablets or hydroxychloroquine sulfate tablets for human use. So I think this one is just kind of 
fascinating, um, where you know, the, the, the first part of this is, again, kind of like the Laetrile example. It's not so much you know, explicit misinformation, but it is suggesting that if you are you know, authorizing the prescribing of this, it is communicating to the public that there would be reasons to take it. Uh, and then the second part of this is you know, almost an acknowledgement that this is misinformation. Um, it is saying that the pharmacist you know, can't actually talk to the doctor or patient about it. Um, and communicate their view. Um, the second part was ultimately blocked on First Amendment grounds for interfering with the First Amendment rights of uh, pharmacists. Uh, last COVID example is masking. Um, this, you know, as we moved on in the pandemic, became a more polarized issue. And some places, either wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, became a marker of politics. Um, and alongside that, there was a lot of misinformation about masks that fell into two broad categories. One is that they don't work. Um, and the second is that they're actively harmful. Um, and so there was misinformation on both of those points. You see here in the picture, the you know, appropriation of the I can't breathe um, mantra uh, as a, a part of that. So at least 10 states prohibited mass mandates um, by some sort of statute um, or required an opt-out, which again is a way of just prohibiting mass mandates. Um, and this again sends a, a strong communicative signal. Um, these ones you know, did not, uh, for the most part, have, have the misinformation about mass directly put into the law, but I mean clearly the prohibition of uh, mass mandates is, is sending a signal that they are not necessary and, and not required. Um, and, and some of them, Arkansas, for example, said that they were a burden on public health um, in the whereas clause introducing uh, its, its law. Um, there was also, and this is an area where there actually was, were more executive orders, um, and a lot of those executive orders explicitly referenced you know, both of those theories, that, that masks were not actually doing anything productive, and in fact, um, were harmful. So I will skip over the examples of that so that we have um, enough time to get to the point here. Um, which is my attempt to put this on the same chart. Um, so, you know, all of these COVID examples are, are related, so it's not surprising that they're sort of lighting up the same things here. Um, so, you know, we've got politics and, you know, we'll spare you the charts, but, you know, there are lots and lots of metrics about how people's views about COVID became polarized on um, political lines. Um, there's an element of discrimination here as well that I will come back to in a second. Um, there's definitely financial motive. So this was um, a week or so ago, there was a Washington Post story talking about all the money that um, different anti-vaccine groups brought in over the course of the pandemic. And those anti-vaccine groups also became anti-mask groups and pro-ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine groups. So I mean, all those things merged together. Um, there's fear for all three, although it's different kinds of fear. So you know, only in the case of these alternative therapies was it really fear of COVID. Um, in the other two cases, it was actually morphed into fear of the vaccines and fear of masks. So that's maybe something a little different. Um, there was clearly you know, distrust of government and or political polarization that led to conspiracy theories that then led to additional types of fears. Um, so, what is different about this or interesting about this or important about this for the future of public health law? And here are some general thoughts on this. Um, I think two things that I wanna to try to talk about quickly. Um, so one is this interaction between misinformation and hyper-individualism, um, where you know, I, 
I'll, I'll get into this idea, but I think you know the, the purpose that the misinformation is, um, the, the work that the misinformation is doing there is to allow for the denial that there are trade-offs that need to be made. Um, and then the second point is about the nature of truth uh, and, and how we deal with public health law where every fact is actually gonna be contested. So on this first point, and this is kind of getting back to the discrimination point, the Laetrile example aside, if you look at the historical examples that I talked about, misinformation was often used to limit what some category of, you know, quote unquote, other people could do. Um, so it was really about you know, policing or reinforcing social hierarchies, and you know, that was often connected to racism, sexism, other forms of um, discrimination. Um, and this still happens today. So, I mean, didn't talk about anti-trans laws, but I think that was another case of misinformation being deployed in a way that is very consistent with that historical uh, tradition. Here in COVID, um, with respect to, to masking, but with respect to opposition to social distancing efforts too, the restrictions were placed on the public as a whole, including those with political power. And this prompted the backlash. This is what prompted um, the pushback. That pushback very quickly became politicized and then misinformation was instrumentalized as part of that pushback. So the rejection of social distancing, of mass, this herd immunity theory, um, I think can also be seen, and this is the, to quote uh, Professor Luke Winslow from Baylor, um, he called this quote a catastrophic form of social Darwinism. Um, that there was you know, an implicit idea here that we don't need restrictions because those who are strong and fit will be fine and those dying were you know, too old or too weak anyway or had lots of comorbidities and there was just lots of denial that those of people who were dying from COVID were actually dying of COVID. Um, and that I think has a you know, very strong intersection with racism and classism that you know, COVID-19 made the already vulnerable more vulnerable. Um, those who lived in, in crowded places and had to travel on public transportation and had to show up for work in person um, were the ones who were, were most at risk and there were pretty massive racial and economic disparities uh, in terms of the um, COVID deaths at the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, to say that there was nothing to worry about was really to devalue the lives of others. Um, so one theory, and this is just my theory, uh, is that people latched onto misinformation because it allowed them to object to engaging in collective sacrifice without having to say that that's what they were doing. So, you know, you don't wanna have to say like, I don't care about the health of other people. It's a lot easier to say, you know, I don't need my freedom limited because this disease is not really that bad. Um, so, uh, and these public health measures don't work anyway. Uh, so, I mean, it's just a, a theory, um, but you know, I, I think that that might be the work here that the information, the, the misinformation was actually doing in um, some of these examples. And you know, that got transformed into this super individualistic view of medical freedom. Um, so this is other language in state laws um, from Tennessee. Everyone in the state is and must remain free to choose uh, or to decline to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, this was Idaho. The decision to receive a vaccination is a very personal and individual decision, which is not historically how we have thought about vaccination. And individuals should not be treated differently or discriminated against because they have or have not received a coronavirus vaccination. Uh, Florida, it is the intent of the legislature that Floridians be free from mandated facial coverings, mandates of any kind related to vaccines and discrimination based on such vaccination status. Um, so, you know, there, there's a long history of sort of medical freedom efforts, which again, Lewis Grossman's book 
goes through. But here we have a much broader vision of what that medical freedom looks like. Uh, it's not just about access to life-saving medications, which is most of what his book is about. Um, it is about medical freedom to not get vaccinated um, or to not have to uh, wear a mask or to not have to comply with social distancing uh, requirements. And there's lots of language you know, in laws like this making that explicit that that was actually what was going on from the legislature's uh, perspective. I think it's quite notable that two of these laws use the word discrimination. Um, this is really the language and framing of the anti-vaccine movement um, finding its way into law. And again, it's a lot easier to take that position that vaccination and masking and so forth is a purely personal choice if you don't think the virus is really a risk in the first place. Um, and so I think that's the, the work um, that is going on here. Post-truth idea. Um, this, uh, another article that Wendy Parmet wrote with a different colleague, Jeremy Paul, um, talking about COVID as the first tr post-truth pandemic. Um, they said, quote, what seems different today is that we confront not simply deceptions, or erroneous statements, but rather a deep skepticism about the very idea that truth exists. Um, put differently, Professor Sarah Hahn, who's at, at Washington and Lee Law School and has been writing about this post-truth idea um, since before COVID, said, quote, post-truthism teaches that people should not use evidence-based reasoning to make decisions, but should rely instead on emotion, intuition, and belief, which is, that sounds familiar, that's pretty much Stephen Colbert's idea of truthiness. Um, and my kind of takeaway from working through these examples is I think we're seeing that idea um, converted into law in the area of public health. So you know, what we're seeing in states with anti-vaccine laws, with anti-mask laws, with these ivermectin and um, hydroxychloroquine rules is an invitation for people to decide for themselves uh, what is true and what is not true and then have that decision codified and respected in law irrespective of what the science says on the topic. And if you look at the press coverage when these laws were passed, you see lots of things like this. This was from Tennessee, which actually I think is the only state that passed a law allowing you to get ivermectin without a prescription from a doctor. You can just go into a pharmacy and get it. Um, so this was one legislator saying, you know, there's science that says it works and science that says it doesn't work. There are several doctors that are very well thought of that think it's something they can help, and there are many that say it can't. So we're just, you know, who knows what is true? Um, we're just going to let people make their own decisions, even though there was actually a quite strong medical consensus about what was true and um, what was not. And I, you know, I think some legislators like very much believe the misinformation. And I think other legislators are more in this post-truth camp of just, who knows? Well, it's not my job to figure it out. We'll just let people make the decisions for themselves about what it is that they're gonna do. Um, and I think you know, that idea that there really is no difference between fact and opinions and people can just kind of make their own choices about that can have really disastrous consequences and is leading to what you might call post-truth public health law. Um, and I think that is something that might be largely new, although the roots of it are certainly you know, precede COVID. COVID was just all of this coming uh, together. So what does that look like? Um, medical freedom in its super broad sense, but only for some people. Um, so, you know, not freedom to seek gender affirming care, not freedom to seek abortion, but a very, very broad notion of uh, medical freedom for some people. Um, 
This has been translated into broad limitations on public health authority that are not just limited to COVID. So um, Michelle Mello and others had an article in BMJ this week just going through what laws have been passed and how many of them are not just limited to COVID but actually have impacts going forward on public health law. Um, this might well spread to other areas of law where we start thinking that you know what precautions people need to take is is not the government's business but is an individual um, decision. So this is a quote from David Gorski uh, about that. Um, there was the Supreme Court heard arguments yesterday uh, in a, a case where states had tried to prevent uh, social media sites from taking down misinformation, um, which I think is very much a reflection of um, this idea that you know it's not the government's place to say what is true, and you know, beyond that, we're going to not let other people say what is true. Um, we are going to require social media um, companies to allow for the proliferation of uh, misinformation. And of course, that's, you know, from First Amendment perspective, you're restricting the First Amendment rights of the social media companies. Um, so again, it's, you know, First Amendment freedoms for some, but not others. Um, other First Amendment implications, um, this, I, again, is something that has deeper roots that um, this is, um, that ties back to sort of the tobacco work that I've done where um, you know, the tobacco companies, for decades, um, their whole goal was to convince people that you know, there was no truth. We just don't know um, what the harms of, of tobacco use are or aren't. Um, Doubt is our product was a, a famous quote from the internal um, tobacco documents showing that they, they knew that quite explicitly. They were trying to cultivate the idea that you know, we can't really say for sure what the truth is. Um, and you know, that can get reflected into legal doctrine and in the compelled speech context of you know, making people um, uh, provide disclosures about you know, their products, the warnings about their products. Um, the courts have now moved towards the position, well, you know, if something's controversial and you know, people are, um, you know, maybe have different strong opinions about it, then we can't require a warning about it. And you know, controversial, I think, used to be defined as factually controversial, and now it's, it is increasingly meaning politically controversial. And you see that in the you know, NIFLA versus Becerra decision uh, and, and other decisions. Um, and then administrative law. So I mean, the major questions doctrine um, also now says, well, if a topic is controversial, then essentially it's something that an agency can't do. Um, and you know, only Congress can, can legislate in areas that are controversial. And that, I mean, came, that was, you know, the, the official major questions doctrine can't, hasn't been announced yet, but that was a you know, huge piece underlying the rejection of OSHA's attempt to impose a vaccine mandate was essentially exactly that. So this is moving into all these different areas of law and you know, I think there's, you know, anytime there's been either a public health disaster or advances in public health, there has been backlash. Um, so the backlash piece of this is not new, but in the past, legislatures picked a side and decided what was true or what was not true, and sometimes they got that wrong, um, but they picked a side. And, uh, made policy based on that choice. And the fact that legislatures are increasingly unwilling to do that and really don't even think it's their job to do that necessarily now, um, I think is a very, very dangerous sign for, um, for public health law. So I will stop there um, on that somewhat depressing note. Um, I think there is you know, a lot of work to do to, to figure out what the role of public health is um, and the role of schools of public health in uh, responding to all these changes and schools of law um, as well. Um, but that's what I'm working through and uh, thank you for inviting me here to talk about it.
So thank you, Micah, for, yeah. uh, for what was a very interesting talk. And um, I've got two comments that may be helpful and I, or not because I'm just formulating them here having listened to this. One, I wonder about when you're thinking about what the motivations for the laws are, whether it would be helpful to look at the timing of when they're mm -hmm. enacted. Right, when I think about when the HIV laws came into effect, obviously it was after we had a test, because before then we couldn't. But also the COVID laws came out a little bit along the way. After there was, it, would, it almost goes into the time when we could other, um, and that after the sort of that initial panic was over and then we get the shift. If that might help in sort of I, both identifying but also perhaps thinking about how we might combat some of those shifts that happen. Um, and I do think you're right in the other. The other piece that the timing might be helpful to look at and as well as maybe trying to think of how we might do better at writing the laws is the stickiness of laws, right? You, as you said, the HIV criminalization statutes are still on the books in many, many states. Um, some of that may be because they still believe in them and we still see cases that suggest that, but some of it may be that because we passed them and we didn't think about that and may not be thinking about it. So some of the misinformation may not have been misinformation at the time, but the statutes yep. are written in such a way they don't progress. That, and certainly we see that in terms of the um, HIV criminalization laws where some but not many at the beginning had uh, comments about condom use for prevention, most mm -hmm. didn't, and now we are at least seeing laws that might be more flexible in saying prevention methods as identified by public health. We may not see as much of that in the future if we're in that straits, but you know, just sort of some things that provoke from what you said. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and the restriction of public health authority is, is I think, particularly dangerous because it takes away flexibility. I mean, the, a lot of the statutes that got repealed were ones that just didn't try to be too specific about what public health authorities could do. But, um, you know, going forward, they're not going to have that. So echoing the thanks. Um, for uh, sharing your your many insights at uh, about the the war against many of us in the room, um, one one quick comment, and that is also about the motivations. That it might be interesting to try to tease apart the ideology, religion, and politics, because there are clearly, as you understand probably better than I do, times where they coalesce, but times where yep. they um, kind of function in ways that are. That are that, that are independent, but I was wondering if what your thought was about how this trend um, fits in with the kind of larger trend of uh, preemption. Particularly, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about state level preemption um, because um, it, it seems to me like it's been catalyzed, but there was quite a trend line pre-COVID. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a huge overlay here that a lot of these laws actually were preemptive laws. They were, they were the state saying that local governments can't have mass mandates or can't have um, vaccine mandates. Um, as you said, the, I mean, preemption battles um, had long preceded COVID, uh, but the nature of them, I think, has changed somewhat where, I mean, again, I mean, it was the tobacco industry that sort of pioneered this tactic of going state to state to preempt uh, local governments from passing smart free laws initially, and then the gun industry copied and did um, the same thing. And so you had industries doing that, and you still have industries. I mean, you have like Airbnb now, like going to the, um, state legislature to um, you know, prevent local governments from, from passing their own laws. So you still have that, but this um, ideologically focused preemption um, is something that I think we're seeing more and more of. Um, and you know, the idea that um, you know, this, you know, if you want to sort of call it an 
you know, ideology or viewpoint of medical freedom or post-truth or whatever, the idea that that um, also has to be applied um, at the state level, uh, sorry, at the local level to other communities that think differently. Um, and you know, really that, that local communities, I mean, when we've had this polarization in a lot of states between cities and states, and the idea is that local governments can't just pursue the policies that they wanna pursue um, because the state government disagrees with those policies um, is, is I think something that has changed in a quite significant way and not just through COVID before it as well, but I think COVID sort of solidified that pattern. So we're gonna have to, sorry, Carlos <laughs> call, we're at time and I wanna be respectful, I know he has a very important lunch to get to <laughs> with the uh, College of Law, but uh, thank you all for joining us today in person and online. I know we had some really wonderful people joining us online as well, so I wanna recognize them, but mostly wanna say thank you, Micah, for coming to Georgia and speaking with us today. We really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you.